The Orc's career, apart from the Second World War, was spent entirely in the Indian Army, a choice dictated by family tradition, inclination, and insufficient private income to afford an officer's life in the British Army. Orkinlex, son of a colonel in the Indian Army, was born in 1884. When he was eight, his father died. His mother scraped together the money to send him to Wellington and to Sandhurst, where he passed out high. In 1903, he returned to India and within a year was posted as a subaltern to the 62nd Punjabi Regiment. Did, did not having a, a, a private income make a, set you apart from other officers? Did it make you into a different sort of soldier, do you think? Uh, not in the Indian Army. It would have been the British But the Indian Army was better paid relatively to the British Army. The officers were better paid and um, the expenses were less. There was less social, um, I think, less social expense and expenditure. And there were fewer officers in the regiment. And one got along on one's pay. One couldn't have lived on one's pay in an ordinary British infantry regiment at that time. Did you like India at first sight? Well, I think I liked the space. I liked the people. It was very, very interesting. And the life in India, although you hadn't got you hadn't got the sort of amusements you get in England, like music halls and that sort of thing, there was any amount to do. I mean, even if you had no money, you could generally manage to get a gun and shoot, and you had a pony to ride. And the, the, the whole country was full of interest to me. When you first went out there, did you think that British India would ever come to an end? I don't think subalterns thought like that at all. That's right. Not second lieutenants. <laughs> Later on, perhaps, <laughs> but what, not then. What the, did second lieutenants think about? The second lieutenant thought it was going on forever. I think most, most British officers did too. Uh, that, this is 1903 we're talking about, you see. There's no question of India becoming independent or anything like that. There was a benign British rule, one thought it would go on forever. Were you more professional in your attitude to soldiering than, than other officers? serving in the Indian Army? Perhaps, yes. Not to be a snob about it, but I think soldiering was in my blood and I really cared for nothing else. I, think. I mean, I played games and, and uh, went in for shooting birds, birds and sport and that sort of thing, but uh, soldiering is what I really cared about. What was your first command? Oh, probably commanding that detachment right up in Tibet in 1906, 400 miles from anybody. Only about 60 men, but still there you were. And there was no connection between you and India except by mule or pony. And over passes about 25,000 feet. It was an independent command. There were only 60 men, but still one had was responsible for them. <coughs> that was the first one. How old were you then? 1906, 16, 22. Very young. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes. What would you say was your most exciting command? The best of all commands is commanding a battalion. As a colonel, with 600, 700 good men under you, entirely re responsible for them and for the officers. I think that was the best time of all. Why was that the best? Well, it was yours. And you knew, you knew practically all the men in the regiment, 800 of them. Your officers you knew, and your word was law. And you were responsible for the whole thing. Efficiency, comfort, happiness, welfare, everything. It was a family. By far the best command I ever had. After ten years in India, Orkin Lex saw his first action, not there, but in Egypt, in the Great War. In 1915, his regiment fought the Turks along the Suez Canal. The Ork was 29. We were on the canal to begin with, but that was only a very small battle. That was our first battle, where the Turks tried to cross the canal. And we were on the, the, the west bank, and they came over to the east bank, and they actually got across one boat. And our people, our men charged down the bank and put a bayonet into them, and then they, that was all that. The next day we crossed and pushed them back. That was the first battle. And it was quite exciting. Frightening? Exciting. Was it frightening? Um, yes. I was a machine gun. I had, a, I had the machine guns of the regiment. I was across from the Turkish side of the canal in a sort of fort. 
and I remember going into action for the first time with them. And I remember the first bullet that went over my head, which made me duck damn quickly. <laughs> but after all, I got used to it very quickly. Between the two world wars, Auchinleck was rapidly promoted, three times mentioned in dispatches, decorated, and in 1936 emerged as deputy chief of the Indian general staff. At the start of the Second World War, the Orc came home. His first command was in Norway. He was sent to take over that ill-fated expedition already in a shambles. He captured Narvik and then, as ordered, evacuated his army. On his return, he was made responsible for defending Southern England against German invasion, now, after the fall of France, thought imminent. The territorial divisions were all uh, being trained hard and uh, coming into picture. But the regular army is just being reorganized, you see. And uh, what we were worrying about then was whether the enemy, whether the German would land or not. And all our energies were devoted to the defense of the coast. You see, my front ran from Bogner to Bristol, which is quite a long way. <laughs> and not very many people behind it, either. Was it alarming, holding a line from Bogner to Bristol? Well, one sometimes wondered what would happen if the Germans did land, because there were very few troops there, really. What do you think would have happened? Uh, I think we should have held them. But... Uh, I don't know. One, uh, very difficult to say, really. Mind you, the televisions were magnificent in material, but they hadn't had a hell of a lot of training. They hadn't had time to train. You see, in the, the regular army has come back from Dunkirk. Had to be completely reorganized. They were pretty well... Disorganized when they arrived. In 1940, the Orc was sent back to India as CNC, the highest post an Indian Army officer could normally expect to attain. But within months, he was moved again. Churchill appointed him to the most testing command of his career, the Middle East. General Auchinleck took over from General Wavell. The Italian army had collapsed. Rommel had arrived in the desert and driven the Allies back across the frontier of Egypt, except for a small Allied force left behind in Tobruk. This was the situation Auchinleck inherited. The next 12 months were the most controversial of his career. From the start, he was under fierce pressure from Churchill to speed up the counter-attack. But like Montgomery after him, he consistently refused to move until he was confident he had a sufficient force properly trained and equipped. At the end of 1941, the Crusader offensive was launched, driving the Axis back and relieving Tobruk. But the tide turned again early in 1942. Rommel, despite inferior strength, counter-attacked. The 8th Army was defeated at Gazala and again forced to retreat to the Egyptian border. Tobruk fell with the capture of 35,000 troops and valuable equipment, a major disaster. In confusion, the Allied troops fell back through Mersa Matru to El Alamein, where Auchinleck decided to make his stand. His battle there in June 1942, five months before Montgomery's more famous victory, has since been accepted as the turning point of the war in the desert. It was the first time that Rommel's offensive had been checked. Some military historians claim that this battle and not Montgomery's, was the battle that rarely counted. Despite this major achievement, Churchill, restless, impatient, and under political pressure at home, flew out to Egypt to relieve Auchinleck of his command, replacing him by Alexander and Montgomery, to whom all the glory was subsequently given. Auchinleck found some of the Prime Minister's eager interventions amateurish, and their relationship had always been a bit prickly. Oh, I had a great respect for him. Very great respect. But I'm not sure that he realized what the difficulties, what difficulties the army was working under at that time. But of course his job was, was to um, instill into everybody the certainty of winning and the necessity of, of, of um, fighting, which he did do. Really. In what, uh, in what respects do you think he didn't understand uh, what was going on in the desert? 
But I think he was too prone to interfere with the commander in the field and to urge him to do things which he might have done, but he would do them in his own time. I think that was really the trouble with him. Uh, prodding, you might call it. Prodding people who didn't think they wanted prodding. If they'd wanted prodding, he should have removed them. At least that was my point of view. But he did make things difficult occasionally because um, nobody, nobody who was not in command of a big operation like that, and it was a big operation in Egypt, can really understand the difficulties of supply and maintenance and training, all that sort of thing. But it's all real to say you've got a whole t a tank, tank division or a tank brigade or an infantry brigade or an infantry division arriving, fresh troops. You couldn't throw them into battle in the desert straight away. You had to train them. And fighting in the desert is quite different to anything they'd been trained for. I think that's what the, the non-professional mind of a civilian like Churchill, although he had been a soldier, fails to understand, really. And they're prodding to attack before you're ready, before the troops are trained, risking everything. That, that was dangerous. How do you feel after the war when you read that Churchill had said that the delay of four and a half months was a mistake and a misfortune and that you played too much for safety and certainty. Were you hurt by that? Not a bit. I knew what I was talking about, he didn't. How could he know? He couldn't know. I was the only person who could know. I dare say somebody else could have done it more quickly. But one doesn't want to go into those sort of arguments because the commander on the spot is the only one who can say when he's ready. If he doesn't go quick enough, well, then he can be removed. Well, then, but then I wasn't removed because I didn't go quick enough. Why were you removed, do you think? I don't know. <laughs> Fresh new blood. New blood's always a good thing. What was Rommel like as an opponent? Oh, very agile. Very agile. Very dangerous, too. He had his troubles, of course. His German troops were very good. First class. The Italians were not so good. And the bulk of his army was Italian, really. Oh, he's a first class commander. You couldn't, you couldn't, uh, couldn't go to sleep when he was about. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> Did he mesmerize people? Well, I was afraid that he might do that. That's why I sent out a certain message that he wasn't he wasn't God Almighty. I was afraid there was a danger of that. The British are rather like that, you know. They, they are rather inclined to idolize their, uh, their opponents, you know. Oh, no, I don't think they were afraid of him, but they, they, they respected him all right. <laughs> mm. You didn't try to counter that in the way that Montgomery did by making himself as idolized as, uh, as Rommel had been? Well, that, that's, that's not my cup of tea, in that fact, really. That's not the way I work, anyway. Uh, Rommel was a very fine soldier, very fine general. I mean, you can't compare a Rommel with a Montgomery, or Montgomery with a Rommel. Not really, they're quite different, quite different types. Is it necessary to make such a fuss about the holding of Tobruk? Not in my opinion, no. Why was it made, then? I don't know. It was Churchill who wanted Tobruk held? Yes. I, I, it, 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 as far as I was concerned, it had no strategic value at all. None. So that all the people who were captured there and all the effort spent on holding it... They should have been taken out. Alamein was much more important, from your point of view, as a place to hold. Uh, Alamein was important as, a, as the only defensive position in which you could protect Egypt. Holding the book didn't, didn't protect Egypt in the least. They just, they just uh, curtained it off, that's all. Contained it. It was waste. Was your Alamein more significant than Montgomery's Alamein? I think that's very difficult to answer. We were preparing to take the offensive in September, whether Montgomery had arrived or not. But the fact was that Rommel had been checked 
and his offensive has been halted. And he admits himself in his book that he's been thrown on the defensive. So perhaps, uh, it, it, perhaps it was the turning point. Because one had, uh, I had every intention, if I'd stayed, if I'd remained in command, of resuming the offensive in September. We'd had reinforcements, and we have casualties have been replaced, tanks have been replaced, and Rommel had been halted. He failed to make any advance. In fact, we had done the advancing such as it was, in a small fashion. Mm -hmm. Is it true that Montgomery used your plans for the Alamein? I don't, I don't think there's much difference between them, really. No, I think it was his plan. Do you feel that Churchill understood what you'd achieved at Alamein? I think so. I think he must have. Then he was desperate, you know, he was desperate, desperately searching after results to keep the morale in England up and to keep the war going. One can't blame him in any way. I was thinking of Churchill's allegation that everyone was looking over their shoulder to make sure of their place on the lorry. Yeah, but that was, that was completely wrong. There was no way of defeat about it when Montgomery arrived. We had already undertaken two offensives against Rommel, and he admits it in his book. Hmm. That, that's, that's a misstatement altogether. There's nothing wrong with the troops. Do you, do you, can you tell me about Churchill's visit out to the desert when he came out? Well, he came met the, met the commanders and had breakfast, I think, or lunch. He didn't like my headquarters very much. Too many flies for him. But on the other hand, um, if I'm commanding, I like to be more or less in the same, live in the same conditions as the troops under me and not in luxury. But I think possibly he'd been very well done by the RAF, who, no blame to them, of course, because their headquarters are much further back. They'd given him a magnificent breakfast or meal. We were living uh, under rather foul conditions, but no more foul than the troops, which suits me. I'd rather do that than live, live in comfort. Which comfort. Do you think that had an effect on him, though? Hmm? Do you think that had an effect on him, the discomfort that he had to visit you under? Well, he says he had breakfast in the fly-blown uh, headquarters, but it was a fly-blown headquarters, but that's where we had to live anyway. And I wasn't going back to live in Cairo in, in, in the house of the troops were out, out in the desert. That's not my way of fighting anyway. Did he seem um, irritable or prickly when you, when you met him then? No, no, he's perfectly all right. Didn't say very much. Did you have any idea at all that he might be on the verge of firing you? Um, I think I had a suspicion, but it came as a shock. No, I think I expected it, eventually. Were you hurt that he didn't tell you himself? I didn't care a bit. And that was me. Would you have respected him more if he'd told you face to face? Oh, I respected him a great deal. I always have respected him. No, I don't think so. If if it, if one had been if he'd been a soldier, he would he would have done it himself. But he wasn't a soldier. So he didn't do it himself. He sent a message. Soldiers are tougher, are they? Well, I think that if I, I mean, if I had to um, relieve anybody, I'd tell him so. My personal then. But that's only army upbringing, really. How... It's a difficult question to put to you, but did you... Did you feel hurt at the way things turned out? Or humiliated at the way things turned out? Possibly slightly humiliated, not hurt. No. Oh no, you see, a change of commander by a politician is a very different thing to a change of commander by a higher commander. It's quite different, really. 
What was your feeling when Montgomery was sent out to take over the 8th Army? I don't think I had any particular feeling. You mean once I'd been told that I, would, uh, I was to go? Oh, I don't think I minded who took over from me. Really? What um, impact do you think he had on the army on arrival? Well, he said that himself. He told you all about that. I was asking what impact you thought he had, rather than what impact I he wasn't said there. He had. I can't tell you. Do you think it made a great difference? I honestly don't know. I shouldn't have thought so. They, 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 nothing happened for about six weeks, two months. And uh, heavy reinforcements arrived meanwhile. There was no immediate change in the situation. There was no immediate offensive. Was the time scale of his operation the same as the time scale that you planned, in effect? No, we planned to start a bit earlier. I did, I think. That I said I hoped to. It all depended on reinforcements and, and uh, equipment coming out from England, because we'd lost a lot of equipment, you see. Why did, why did he claim that you had planned to retreat to the Nile and beyond? What was, the, what was behind that claim? Absolute rubbish. What I did, what I did say... I did plan uh, that if we were driven away from the Alamein position, certain operations would take place. We would retire up the Nile as an army in existence. We were not to be destroyed. And that to, to, to prevent the enemy advancing into Egypt, certain uh, demolitions and that sort of thing would have taken place. Well, that was only sensible. Did you feel a, a, um, a great sense of injustice at the way that his arrival in the desert and your replacement was treated publicly by him after the war and written about by people? No, I don't think I wanted very much, really. I don't think anybody else did, either. I don't think so. I'm curious that, that you never chose to join in the argument or to defend yourself directly? Well, I think history defends oneself, really. I don't think as a soldier it's one's own one duty to defend oneself. And after all, um, history has proved uh, quite accurate what happened. I think. Whenever Montgomery and you crossed tracks, there seems to have been trouble. Why was it that you, you didn't get on together? Was it a personal difficulty between you and him, do you think? Yes. And what? Well, <laughs> I'm asking what you, why you didn't seem to be able to get on together, the two of you. Well, I suppose we looked on things differently, quite differently from a soldier's point of view, and from any point of view, I think. After he was relieved of his Middle East command, the Orc returned to India, where for a year he had nothing to do. In his own words, the hardest thing for an active soldier in wartime to bear, the worst year in his life. But in June 1943, he was given his second great responsibility. He succeeded Wavell as commander-in-chief in India and remained there for a traumatic experience, the granting of independence in 1947. Working with Lord Mountbatten, the Viceroy, it was the Orc's job to preside over the breakup of the Indian army he had served and loved for over 40 years. He was responsible for ensuring that during partition, men and equipment were fairly divided between India and Pakistan. Nehru, the Indian leader, kept constant pressure on him, as did Jinnah, his Pakistani counterpart. His attempts to achieve a fair division, enough to tax Solomon's wisdom, brought recrimination from the Indians and admiration from the Pakistanis. Though for the Orc himself, this unwelcome involvement in the hysterical politics of the subcontinent and the destruction of the army he had loved brought only heartbreak. The thing that one had envisaged as oneself until it came about, it would have been impossible to think of. But once it was um, ordained, it went off very smoothly indeed. 
thanks to the British officers, the few of them that were left, and thanks to the men themselves who were sensible. As I say, my own regiment was split in two, just like that. <clears throat> but they wept on each other's shoulders when they were split up. And did you weep when they were split up? I wasn't there. I was, I was commander in chief. I didn't weep, but I might have. <laughs> I felt rather like it. So we all did, I think. Why did you feel the breakup so strongly? Why did it matter so much to you? Well, the breakup of a home that one had had for 40 years, sort of thing, a regiment, 30 years. And a regiment that had been in existence for a very long time. Well, I don't think any soldier liked to see it up. Because it's a living thing. It's not just a collection of soldiers. I mean, it's really, it's really. Oh, it was a very fine force for the Indian Army, there's no doubt about it. The British, the British people didn't know very much about it, but it did a lot of fighting for them, in many wars. The long service army, composed of soldiers who wanted to be soldiers, not because they had to be, all volunteers. Did you feel closer to Pakistan than to India? No, I don't think so, not really. I don't think so. Perhaps I knew them a little bit better. Oh, no, because uh, half the regiment came from India, you see, really. The Muslim part of the regiment came from Pakistan. The Hindu and, and the Rajput came from India. No, they were the same to me, as much. I don't think I was pro <laughs> I tried not to be, anyway. <laughs> what was your impression of um, Mountbatten in that post? As what? Viceroy? As Viceroy, yes. Oh. Very good indeed. Oh, yes. Very difficult situation. Oh, no, I don't think anybody had any complaints there. I don't think either side had, as a matter of fact. Don't remember much, still. No, he had a very difficult job, and um, one had to support him as one could, I suppose. I think one did, really. Oh, no, I had no trouble there at all. How about your relationship with Nehru? Oh, he's a great man. And I think not unduly prejudiced, really. And Jinnah? Jinnah? Jinnah was more difficult. He was a, uh, Jinnah was a definite leader, but he hadn't got the... Well, of course, he was a leader of a minority of the minority, and therefore at a disadvantage, a great minority. Mind you, I didn't mix up in politics, but Jinnah could be difficult at times. Once or twice he very nearly brought about a war between India and Pakistan. Very nearly. Which you effectively stopped? Well, I stopped one of them, yes. Mm -hmm. But then... Um, what did you do to stop it? Oh, well, it was reported to me from the uh, Royal Pindia or somewhere that um, by the uh, Commander-in-Chief of Pakistan, who was a Britisher, British officer, that Jinnah was about to invade Kashmir. This was in the middle of the night sometime. And I was the plane early in the morning and went up and met him in, uh, in, in um, where is it, Orissa or Lahore, I think. And we had a meeting there, and I just told him that... Uh, if he did that, all the British officers would have to stand down. There would be no officers left in the regiment. So. Well, that settled him as much, really. He, he withdrew. What were your feelings on the day that you finally left India? Oh, uh, with great sadness. Sadness and a sense of failure to a certain extent. Failure in the, in the, in the, in the, in the final, the latter end of what one was trying to do. A feeling of sorrow, of course, of uh, uh, leaving a country one had served in for nearly 40 years and of leaving the soldiers that one had become very fond of. In fact, of leaving a country which had almost become one's own. It had become one's own, really, much more so than England. Yes, but it passed off. But re one realizes it is, it is, it is, uh, 
What's the word here? It had to be inevitable. It was inevitable. But it didn't. There was no. There was no sort of um, weeping or <laughs> shouting about it. It went off very quietly. When you left India, you were offered a peerage, which you turned down. Why? Why? Well, because I didn't want to be a peer. I preferred to remain what I was. What have you got against being a peer? Well, there's too many of them, I think, really. That's not a peer, anyway. No. Maybe in a bit of peak. I honestly didn't want to become one, really. Well, if you must realize that at the end of a career of 40 years and doing one's dentist for an army that one loved, that one was in a certain, a certain state of, uh, not mutiny, but almost despair. Hit one very closely, you see. Me more than anybody else, because I happened to be the commander in chief and responsible for all those British officers who had served in India. And now we're chucked out like that, you see. And the Indian soldiers who were being pushed around the town of like the regiments tore in half and so on. It's difficult for a civilian to understand that, I think, but it, for a soldier, it is a, the end of a life's work, you see. And perhaps the destruction of a life's work, in a way. Does that make nonsense? No. Hmm. Well, I felt it very much. So that you felt perhaps it wasn't an achievement to be honoured, a peerage, on the contrary, perhaps. Well, perhaps I did feel that, yes. What prospects did you see for yourself? You left India in 47 and you were only 63. No prospects at all. What use did anybody got for the field marshal on half pay? You recognised then that it was the end of your career? Mm. Well, I didn't see what else I could do. I did, I did join a business as a director, to that sort of thing. When I got back to England, I was offered one or two directorships, but they were really paper directorships. So, 27 years ago, the York gave up his Indian command and effectively retired. He was only 63. He took on a few business and charitable commitments, but chose to shun the controversies that surrounded his career, preferring, as he puts it, to rely on the judgment of history.